Okay, and we're live. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. This is the MSU Science Festival's Afternoon Science Snack. Uh, my name's Catherine from the Science Festival. I'm here with Roxanne Troon as well. And today we're joined by Jim McGrath from Nature Discovery. Welcome, Jim. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. Good to be back. Um, so before we start, do you mind introducing yourself, telling us a little bit about what Nature Discovery is all about and a little bit about what we'll be talking about today? Sure. So we're a little private nature center. You may have never heard of one of those before uh, that we run right out of our house out north of Williamston, Michigan here, not too far from MSU campus. And um, we have uh, built an addition onto our house that is not very large, you know, paid for uh, with our own money, but we call it the biggest little nature center in Michigan. It may be small in size, but wow, do we have a lot going on there. Um, what we especially get known for is we have accumulated over the years what we call the largest zoo uh, of Michigan native reptiles and amphibians. So there's 52 species total in the state, snakes, turtles, frogs, salamanders, lizards, and we're maintaining about 40 of the 52 right now at our place, probably 100 individuals altogether of those 40 species, including, we're here today to talk about it, what I call the Grand Slam of Michigan turtles. Can you tell I'm the marketing guy of the, of the uh, operation? Awesome. Okay. Well, we're really glad to have you. Um, you want to just go ahead and dive right in? Sure, definitely. Okay. So um, I am going to, uh, before I start showing you all, all 10 species of Michigan turtles, I'm going to go ahead and uh, switch to uh, a PowerPoint to show you a couple of images. There we go. I like to use this as a uh, opening slide to a lot of my presentations and groups to let people understand more about what drives us to do what we do for a living. We want people to know the natural world around them better, Michigan wildlife education, largely because the things you are doing outside are determining whether these things live or die. Now, if you can't tell one bird from another, one butterfly from another, one turtle from another, et cetera, et cetera, you are in no position to notice if that diversity is declining. So in this little collage I have right here, this is our yard north of Williamston. I took all of these photos in our yard north of Williamston, and yet most people could not go around that collage and name every species that's on there. You might get the Oriole or something, or maybe one or two of, of these and so on. So you look at that biodiversity word there in the middle. We made it our job to get people to recognize biodiversity that's around them. And you know what we find? People who recognize it automatically value it. There's that next word below biodiversity. They can't help but value it. And the people who value it then want it to survive. They want to make sure that it is preserved for future generations and so on. Okay, I'm going to go to another slide here, I hope. There we go. So uh, we keep our turtles in various pools and tanks inside, but once the weather warms up, we've been waiting in May for this to happen. Once the weather warms up, we move them into their little kitty swimming pools out on our patio. And you can see there's a, a pool with our smaller turtles and a pool with our bigger turtles that at the time I took this picture, nobody's out basking here. Uh, but anyway, um, we have families come over and in fact there was just a family who came over checking out all of the turtles of Michigan in the pools. They love feeding them, uh, dropping turtle food sticks into them. Uh, we even have you know other things that we bring out right now during the COVID-19 restrictions. We bring things out from the center to share with uh, just families or individuals at a time, but there's ways, you know, to make appointments doing that. So, you know what, this is a presentation in everything I've told you so far that is all about allowing turtles to survive around us. And so I have a presentation that I give to adult audiences called Michigan Turtles in Trouble. And does this Blanding's turtle look like it's in a situation where it might be in trouble? Just for instance, Turtles in roads don't mix. Turtles in cars don't mix. It ends up bad for one of those two items and you know who. 
Okay, so um, the next slide I'm going to show you, we're gonna talk about turtle classification a little bit. So turtles are um, in order of, of reptiles and an order has a bunch of different families in it. In Michigan is 10 species of turtles. They're on the posters behind me here, but those 10 species are representatives of four different turtle families. And here's the way they break down. You see on this sheet here, there's a family called Trionicidae, and that family is the softshell turtles. And we have one representative of the softshell turtles. It's called the Eastern Spiny Softshell. You see it right, right below the word in the picture. Uh, Kinosternidae is the musk and mud turtles. We only have one representative of Kinosternidae. Chelygridae is the snapping turtles. We only have one uh, representative of that family in Michigan. And then the painted this family in my today, which there are seven, seven of Michigan's 10 species of turtles belong to this big family called the pond turtles in my today. So I find that kind of interesting that they break down this way as far as the four families. One, 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 ba-boom, seven. And if you look at this picture right here, the representative uh, in each of these families here, the three that are sitting in a family all by themselves, they look quite a bit different than what you think of in your mind as a regular turtle. Look at the look at the soft shell turtle. The thing looks like you know, kids are calling it the pancake turtle all the time. It's uh, it, it doesn't have scales for a shell. It's got skin with that long snout nose. So you can tell structurally, wow, that thing belongs in its own family. That one, the musk turtle. Uh, that's the topmost one in the middle there. You can't see it from this angle, but the musk turtle has, uh, first of all, its shell is very elongated. Do you see how it's going towards the shape of an egg almost? Elongated compared to other turtle shells, but you can't see it from this angle, but it's very high domed as well. And that's a small turtle, so they sit in their own family. Snapping turtle sits in its own family, the common snapping turtle. We've got a little uh, less than a year old one in this picture with the rough shell. And then the painted turtle is an example of your regular pond turtles. They're good swimmers. Uh, they're found in a variety of aquatic habitats. So uh, let's see here. I'm just gonna cover a couple other slides then we're gonna go back to the uh, live things here. Here are things every Michigan citizen needs to know. These are the four main threats to turtle survival where you live. And everybody should have this. If you're concerned about turtles, have these four things on your mind all the time when you're encountering turtles. Number one, roadkill. Uh, turtles get out on roads, they get hit by cars. We see this all the time. I'm glad so many people I, I see are trying to rescue turtles off the road. Raccoons. We can talk about that a little bit more, but in a nutshell, I'll just tell you, raccoons are major um, predators of turtle eggs. And we'll talk specifics about that. Like a lot of other uh, wild animals, there's a habitat loss factor. Hey, you know, the, the good wetland for this particular turtle has been polluted or destroyed or degraded in some way. And then finally, we're gonna touch on illegal collecting. People who may or may not know better see a turtle outside and they think to themselves, oh, you know, I want to, you know, turn this into a pet or something like that. And a number of these are state protected. It is illegal uh, uh, to do that. Okay, so here are the four species in Michigan of the 10 that have special protected status by the Michigan DNR. That top one, the Blandings turtle, he has a bright yellow chin. And the Blandings is the only one of the four that can be found around the greater Lansing area. By the way, you're not gonna find any of these other four in this part of the state. Wood turtle, listed as special concern. The Eastern box turtle is the only uh, terrestrial turtle in the state, uh, lives in woodlands. Uh, they've been wiped out of the greater Lansing area. And then the spotted, is a threatened species, Michigan's rarest turtle. I've only seen a couple of those ever in the wild in Michigan, really rare. Okay, so I'm going to get off of the share, screen share. There we go, I'm back. And um, 
I'm going to start out with a couple of turtles that they're ones that the most people are going to encounter. These are the ones people see the most. I find there are two of Michigan's 10 species of turtles that everybody knows, okay? And so I'm going to grab one here, um, hold it up. A lot of people at home might not be looking at that one saying to themselves, oh, I see that kind all the time. This is a painted turtle. The other one that everybody um, seems to know is the snapping turtle, the painted and the snapping. You know, I think to myself, there's a reason why people all know about the painted and snapping turtle. Here's the reason. They're everywhere. These are the only two Michigan turtles that can be found in every county in the state, including the UP. So people will encounter them no matter where you go in the state. Not only that, the painted and the snapping turtle can occupy almost any type of water. Big, deep lake, yes. Tiny little shallow pond, yes. Big wide river, yes. Tiny trickling stream, yes. Ditch on the side of the road filled with water that sits long enough, painted or snapping turtles show up. No wonder people know these so well. Do you see this painted turtles, uh, dabs of red or orange around the rim of the shell? So the top is the carapace. The bottom shell is the plastron. In between the carapace and the plastron, it's got all these little dabs of red or orange. I'm going to be giving you field marks here, which are your clincher things you should be looking at to know a certain turtle is that. And all around the rim of the shell, you can see it looks like somebody dabbed it with an orange or red paintbrush. No other Michigan turtle has that. You're going to hear me say that a number of times over the course of our time together. This is your clincher field mark to know, yep, that's it. And it can't be anything else. So common turtle, anybody says to me, I saw a turtle today. My response is, was it a painted turtle? And their answer is most of the time, yes, if they, if they know, what, know their turtles. Okay, I'm gonna put that one back. All I've got for a snapping turtle right now is this little one that's actually less than a year old. This was a hatchling from this past late summer. I'll get this up close. This one is a little bit shy and it's pulled its tail in, but uh, snapping turtle, of course, is Michigan's largest turtle. Don't think of a snapping turtle as meaner than other turtles. You know, we found from many, many years of keeping snapping turtles in captivity educationally, once a snapping turtle is, is used to you, not afraid of you, Snapping turtle is one of the gentlest turtles in captivity. That being said, snapping turtle is the one and only Michigan turtle. If it's a big one, if it were to bite you, can mess you up enough where you might be taking a trip to the emergency room, ready care, the hospital or something. That doesn't make it mean or bad. We should adjust our behavior to, you know, be careful what we're doing around a wild, scared one. Now, look at this. You would know you're looking at a snapping turtle, no matter what size it is, because they're the color of mud. Okay, they they have no color to them at all, and that works out well because you find them in muddy habitats. They're down in among the muck and the rocks, and so they camouflage really, really well. And I want to point this out. Let's see, get that lined up. Every snapping turtle. The back edge of its shell, you might be able to make this out, is sawtooth looking. Not all around the shell, just, just the bottom part of it here. And then, snapping turtle has the longest tail of any Michigan turtle. And if I pull this out, it has a dragon-like look to the tail. Can you make out the bumps on the top of it? It almost looks a little bit like a dragon tail or a dinosaur tail or something. So these are good features to look at to know you're looking at a snapping turtle, no matter what the size. Okay. Now, it's a lot more complicated than the turtle lives in the pond. We're talking about these first two that are the habitat generalists. You can pretty much find them everywhere and anywhere, uh, any type of water, and they will wander around on land a little bit. But now we're going to cover some other turtles that have a little bit more specific habitat. This is a young common map turtle. For how common this turtle is, I'm surprised at how few people have ever even heard of it 
and you can go to certain habitats right around here and it's the most common turtle around. You know, the map turtle is largely a river turtle. If there is flowing water around here, this is the most common turtle to be found. Red Cedar River, Grand River, Looking Glass River, all of them. This is the dominant species that's out there. It is a river specialist. So let's get closer with this and look at some field marks on it. It has pinstripes of yellow on its head and neck. You can see those little pinstripes of yellow. And then I'm gonna turn it this way. Behind each eye, it has a yellow spot behind each eye. No other Michigan turtle has that. It also has a pretty strong keel on the top of its carapace right here, okay? Uh, no orange on it. It's just kind of a, a dull color. I'm gonna give you a, a hint. If you are on a bridge on a sunny day, like today, looking down on the Red Cedar River, you know, maybe right over campus or something, and you see a line of turtles out on a log, and you look at that line of turtles, maybe you don't have binoculars with you, but you see one of them in the line on the log is dull, dusty looking. Another one's dull, dusty looking. Another one is dull, dusty looking, but there's one more that is glossy. It looks like a glossy dark stone. You are looking at three map turtles and one painted turtle. Painted turtles, when they come out of the water and their shells dry, they look like a dark polished stone in the sunshine. The map turtle has a little bit of a rough texture to its shell. And because it has this little bit of rough grainy texture, silt that's in, the roiling water in a river gets embedded into its scales. And when it comes out of the water and sits there and dries off, it looks like a dirty, dusty rock, dusty gray rock. So these are good identification from a distance for these. These are really uh, adept at eating snails. They have strong jaws, they can crunch up snails. And we've seen them do this. We'll drop snails into the water. They crunch up the snail shell really easily, sit pieces of it out and gobble up, you know, swallow the, the soft interior. So I love map turtles. Watch for those. While you're on the river, watch for this one. Soft shell turtle. This is a young one, but the soft shell turtle is Michigan's second largest turtle. An adult female can get up to like 13, 14, 15 inches. And they are present on stretches of the Grand River and the Red Cedar. You can also find them on some sandy bottomed lakes. Now I have an alternate name for this and call, instead of calling it soft shell, uh, I like to think that it could have been named the sand turtle because this turtle is the color of sand and is adept at digging into the sand and disappearing within a couple of seconds. Now, if any of these turtles look like they're not having fun being handled, they're not liking it. This one was coming around. You couldn't see it away from the camera, but it was coming around trying to bite my fingers like I've had enough of this. So we would never blame the turtle if it bit us. Hey, it's our fault. We're the ones that are, are disturbing it here. You see that snorkel snout? It's got a snorkel snout. So the soft shell, sometimes I'll see one out in the water, a big one, and the whole turtle is underwater, but all that is up is the tip of its snout and its eyeballs. And you know what it reminds me a little bit of? Did you ever see an alligator or crocodile that's underwater and just its eyes and the tip of its snout are sticking out of the water? Soft shell turtles do that all the time. And the rest of the turtle is underwater. A lot of these other turtles, their whole head comes up like you know your thumb sticking up out of the water. Soft shell often, just the eyeballs and the tip of the nose. And so they can go undetected because of that. But they'll come out and bass with the, with the uh, map turtles and the painted turtles as well. That one's not having a good time. Whoa, almost got me. All right, so uh, we covered one, two, three, four species now. Next one I wanna show you is one of the protected ones, the Blanding's turtle. And I should have gotten a towel. Drippy turtles over a keyboard, not good, not good at all. All right. Look at this one, I like to get it nice and close so you can see this thing smile. Hello. So the Blanding's turtle is the only Michigan turtle 
that looks like it has a permanent smile on its face. You see the way this is struggling? It's not happy. <laughs> but just like a Halloween mask, turtles have stiff flesh on their faces. Whatever face they're born with on their mask, mask head, that's, that's what they're riding with their entire lives. So this uh, Blanding's turtle is looking happy even when it's not. Okay. And so this turtle, do you see it has a yellow chin? The lighting's not very good here, but in the wild, a blanding turtle has a super bright yellow chin. No other Michigan turtle has that. There's saying that again. What's your call your clincher field mark? This turtle inhabits marshy habitats, shallow, weedy water. Do you know of a wetland near your house like that? Shallow, weedy, warm water. That's what this turtle loves. And that also is one of the reasons why it's become so rare. These shallow weedy waters are called vernal ponds and Michigan has lost over three quarters of its vernal ponds. And that is the habitat for Blanding's turtles. They have found, scientists studying Blanding's turtles have found that when they and maybe even into multiple years, that that individual will leave a shrinking vernal pond that's drying out, leave it, crawl across land, this is in the middle of the summer, until it finds another vernal pond, another weedy pond to go into. Well, back in the old days, the state was freckled with vernal ponds and very few roads and cars. So you see what's happened here, when a Blanding's turtle today leaves a shrinking vernal pond in the summertime that's drying out, and it goes across dry land looking for another vernal pond, what is it more likely to run into first, find first, a vernal pond or a highway? And I think we all know what the answer is there. So it is a frequent roadkill victim. You see a Blanding's turtle, bright yellow chin on the road. You want to pick it up and get it off the road in the direction it's facing. Okay, uh, let's see who's next. Next one I want to pick up is one that, hey, any baby, baby boomers or older are going to remember this. The red-eared slider used to be when we were kids sold in pet stores as little baby bright green babies like this you could go to a pet store you could go to a department store like sears go into the pet department and they got these trays with hundreds of these baby turtles they only cost 39 cents a piece you know and they were the red-eared slider this is a southern turtle do you see the reddish orange line behind its uh, eye on its head that's how it gets its name but that's not really its ear it has a bunch of yellow stripes on its head and neck with that one single orangey stripe behind its eye. So that's a good field mark for that one. This is an adult male. It has a spotty pattern on its plastron. Okay, so now it's illegal for them to sell these baby turtles because you know, it uh, was realized that, wow, kids who are getting these as pets were coming down, some of them with salmonella poisoning, and they put an end to the baby turtle trade, which I'm glad of. You need a special permit now to, to sell any turtles that are under four inches in length. Um, oh, did I forget to grab that one? Okay. I have a baby red-eared slider that maybe I'll show you a little bit later. The babies are really bright green in color. I'd like to show you one of those later if we have time. I'm watching my time here. The next one I would like to share with you is another uh, rare protected one. This is the wood turtle. I love this turtle. This is the only Michigan turtle with an all black head, no marks on it. It doesn't have any stripes. It doesn't have any, oh, dripping on my keyboard again. Uh, it doesn't have any spots or stripes, just an all black head. This one you cannot find around this part of the state. You have to go north to find this. This turtle basically only occupies shallow flowing water with largely forested shorelines. It needs those two in combination shallow flowing water river must have forested shoreline over a lot of the stretch of the river where it's hanging out this is the only michigan turtle 
that can feed in and underwater like any other aquatic turtle, but then it can and does come up the bank of the river regularly and go into the woods and feed like a terrestrial box turtle. And it can eat on land. A lot of people are unaware of this. By far, most aquatic turtles are incapable of eating out of the water. They have to be in the water. They have to have water in their mouths and in their throats in order to swallow. This one can go either way. It's an amphibious feeder that way. I think that's pretty cool. This turtle is suffering from all four of the threats that we talked about. Roadkill, yes. Habitat loss, yes. Um, illegal collecting, yes. Raccoons, really bad going after their eggs. We might talk about that more in a little bit. There, we can take some questions too. Uh, we're doing this in a half an hour-ish, but I'm telling you, this is a whole course here. I'm trying to decide what do I include, what, what don't I include with our time limitations. Okay, so the next one I wanna show you is, we talked about the box turtle, and I have a young one right here. There it is. Very high dome shell. It almost looks like uh, the shape of a you know army helmet or something. Uh, every individual box turtle has these patterns, different pattern of yellow or orange or brown on the back. And people who research populations of these actually will take a photo. They don't have to necessarily put a tag on this to recognize the individuals. Every box turtle has its own unique pattern on its back and they can take a photograph of this and then keep track of an album of of turtle backs and know which in which individual a box turtle they're looking at so being a terrestrial turtle they just wander around woodlands eating insects worms fruit uh leaves very very omnivorous uh in a forest and uh this is easy pickings for anybody who might want to pick one up and decide they're going to take it home from a pet. These things can dive underwater like the aquatic turtles and get out of your way and, uh, you know, elude uh, being captured. So it's good for everybody in Michigan to know if you come across a box turtle, uh, enjoy seeing it. Pick it up if you want to inspect it closely, then make sure you put it back down exactly where you uh, found it. Don't take it to another woods and let it go. It won't stay. It knows where home is. Okay. So we love we love our box turtles. But leave them where they where you find them. They've been wiped out of uh, the greater Lansing area now. We don't have many woodlands left for one, but they're hanging on better south and west in the state. You have a better chance of seeing them in woodland habitat south and west. Okay. And then mowing through them all, I think I might only have one more to go. I'm pretty sure I got everybody except one more. This is all dried off, unfortunately. Now it's so pretty when it's uh, when it's wet. But this is appropriately named the spotted turtle. Spotted turtle is Michigan's second smallest turtle. This is state threatened. I think this might even be federally threatened turtle now. This is a hot number in the black market trade. Uh, very difficult to find in Michigan, but look, it is the only one in the state that has perfectly round uh, yellow dots. Some individuals have more, some have less, but perfectly round yellow dots on a black background. You can tell females from males. This is a female. Do you see how she has a pale muzzle? If this was a male, and we do have a male in our collection, his head is entirely black, including his lower jaw there. That's the way you tell these two apart. But anyway, yeah, so there's a black market trade in spotted turtles. And there are people out there who know that if they can smuggle these out of the country and, get, and smuggle them overseas, there are rich people in other countries who will pay thousands of dollars for a spotted turtle. The habitat these live in, by the way, is very shallow water, kind of similar to the Blanding's turtle. Shallow bogs and shallow uh, extensive wetlands that are called fens. The Blanding's turtle can survive in just these little vernal ponds as long as there's a scattering of them around. But the fens and bogs that the uh, uh, spotted turtles occupy have to be more extensive together habitat and there's not a lot of that left in Michigan so you know habitat loss is another issue so I'm watching the clock and I have went almost 
a half an hour. We want to make sure we stick to the schedule. I have so more that I feel like I wish I could share, uh, but I would encourage you, hey, uh, make an opportunity to come on out and see what we've got going on. But are some questions coming in, I presume? Uh, uh, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Roxanne. <laughs> uh, comments right now are the turtle, the last one you showed was so cute. We did have a question on, you'd mentioned uh, if you see a turtle on the road that you set it the same direction it's going. I always thought that was an old wives tale. Is that true that you need to no. keep it's definitely true. The turtle knows, you know, we, we don't give them credit for how smart they are and they know what they're doing. And, it, and even though you might see a wetland on one side of the road, a farmer's field on the other side of the road, you know, and the turtle is heading away from the water, people are inclined to want to put it back into the water and it's out there on the highway again, you know, a half an hour later. So that is a, a good rule to always put the turtle off the road in the direction that it's looking like it wants to go. I want to mention here too that June is turtle egg lane month. I also call June turtle roadkill month. <laughs> for the same reason. These female turtles are coming out of the water to lay their eggs, crossing roads and getting hit by cars. So everybody should be extra vigilant in the month of June and help them out. All right, I have a question from Chelsea. Uh, what happens to the turtles in the winter and how long do the eggs incubate? Okay, uh, so we'll we'll talk about this. There's a lot of variation in species to species, but we'll talk about this in generalizations. You know, as I mentioned, uh, June is turtle egg laying month. Therefore, takes roughly two to two and a half months for those eggs to uh, incubate and ready ready to hatch. So we're looking like late August or early September. You have hatch outs of pretty much all the Michigan turtles where you might see little hatchlings that big, maybe crossing a road if the eggs were laid uh, very often, you know, somewhat close to the road. Um, what was the other part of that question? Did um, I get where, what happens to turtles in the winter? Oh, in the winter, yeah. So a number of these aquatic turtles, which are most of them in Michigan, they have lungs and people might wonder, okay, wait a second, if this thing is down under the ice, and it has lungs, how is it surviving the winter? So they're in the water under the ice. Sometimes they're even a little bit active uh, under that ice. However, um, a turtle that is chilled down, its body down to freezing or near freezing, 32, 33 degrees or something, its oxygen demands go way down when its body is so darn cold. They don't eat all winter long. They hardly move all winter long under the ice. And get this, how cool is this? Turtles have very interesting butts, if I may say so crudely. Uh, uh, all turtles are capable of sucking water up their rear ends, blowing it out, sucking it up, blowing it out. And most of the aquatic turtles are doing this regularly. There's this old oxygen in the water. When an aquatic turtle in the winter under the ice, there's a cat there, they can come up for, you know, to, to use their lungs. The intestine walls act as a simple gill. How cool is this? All these fine capillaries all over the intestine wall, when it sucks water up into the, it's that opening is called the cloaca, the dissolved oxygen that's in that water that gets sucked up into its rectum actually diffuses right through the capillary walls into its bloodstream and it's able to use that as a simple gill. Now in the summertime though, when they're all warmed up and active and eating and everything, they need way more oxygen, they need their lungs. And in the summertime, if a, if a turtle got stuck under the water, you know, somehow got trapped a rock on it or something, even though it can, you know, take in oxygen through its rear end that way, in the summer when it's warm and active, not nearly enough, that turtle will drown definitely will drown. We have a question from Renee. She said, we have uh, found some baby turtles hatching in our garden. Where's the best place to relocate them to keep them safe? Sure, uh, I think that that's a really good timely question right now. If you're finding baby turtles hatching, what look like hatching coming up from underground now, they're painted turtles. The painted turtles hatch in the late summer as well, but strangely, they stay underground. They'll hatch out of their eggs and then stay underground. 
several inches underground and they won't pop up until the ground warms up in the spring and feed people this time of year find baby painted turtles where you find baby snapping turtles in September or something like that. But this, you know, common sense works right here. Where's your nearest body of water? That's probably where the mom came out of. And so you want to give those little turtles a head start? Yeah, get them, get them safe back into, into the nearest waterway, I would say. Right. And then Michelle wants to know, do you know what people from other cultures want the spotted turtles for? You had mentioned that there's that trade of taking the spotted turtles. Yeah, you know, there are Asian countries where turtles are a delicacy to eat. There might even be some, whether they're legit or not, medicinal purposes that they might be using ground up shell for or something like that. But while a lot of these other turtles are being utilized for food, the spotted turtle is pet. It is a pet thing. Okay, that's such a tiny turtle, you're hardly getting any meat or anything off of there anyway. It is people of means who want to have something that nobody else has. So, you know, I look at it as a greed thing. You know, the people who are catching them, oh boy, I can get a lot of money, you know, and the people uh -oh. Are willing to pay all this money to be able to say i have a spotted turtle and you don't you know and so greed greed comes in all shapes and sizes doesn't it you know that makes the world not good for all the rest of us including the turtles <laughs> you had mentioned um raccoons as a, a problem are there any other animals that eat turtles <laughs> Not so much the turtles themselves, unless they're little ones that are nice and, you know, gulp, you know, <laughs> bite size type things. But I'm glad you brought up the uh, raccoons because uh, I didn't get into that as much as I should. Uh, there are other animals that if they smell where turtle eggs were laid, a skunk maybe or a possum might find where they were laid and smell that and dig them up and eat them. But raccoons are horrible. They are the worst. If you see a spot where a turtle laid eggs, you saw it digging the hole and laying the eggs and the next day, it's all been excavated and there's crunched up shells all over the place. It's almost always a raccoon. Uh, you know, our countryside, the entire state is overpopulated with raccoons and they have a nose for turtle eggs. So Jim Harding, who is the, uh, boy, he might be the top turtle expert in the state who's, uh, who's at MSU herpetologist. He was telling me, that easily well over half of all turtle eggs laid in Michigan, regardless of species, well over half of them end up being raccoon food within 24 to 48 hours, over half of them. The wood turtle, I mentioned raccoon depredation of eggs with the wood turtle. Uh, Jim Harding, uh, who studies the wood turtle up north on rivers up north, has found there is so close to 100% Depredation of wood turtle eggs by raccoons, you almost never see baby wood turtles on northern rivers anymore. They're slowly, you know, slipping towards extinction because of really all the factors, you know, people canoeing down a river. Oh, what a cute turtle. I think I'll take it home for a pet. Illegal. Okay. But the raccoons going after their eggs, um, like I say, almost 100%. So we're telling people all the time, don't be nice to raccoons. You don't want to go out there and shoot one. At least don't encourage them, you know, feeding them in their your yard or something. So you should do everything you can to discourage raccoons around your yard and elsewhere. Uh, it's good for the turtles. How many eggs does a turtle typically lay? Uh, that varies with size and species. There's some big snapping turtles that can lay over 50 eggs. Uh, 50, 60, 70, that might be the most. And then you'll have like box turtles that only lay, you know, a half a dozen at the most, you know, two to two to six or something. So it seems like I think for most turtles, that number is probably, I would guess, between 10 and 20. Um, but like I say, the snapping turtle, it seems like the bigger it gets, the more eggs it can drop. So right about in that range, I'd say, sure. That's not a lot to have scavenged by other animals out there. 
<laughs> right. So, uh, you know, and, and on top of this, this just kind of goes to show you how, what a tough world it is for turtle populations to keep going one generation after another is we've got, um, well, they have found from tracking baby turtles that successfully hatched in late summer that most of them, over 90% of them, are dead by the following spring. So, so look at the tremendous mortality in the egg, raccoons getting so, so many of them. The ones that hatch, this is normal. They just have a really high mortality level as baby turtles, and they're only about 5%-ish roughly that make it to see their second year of life. So whatever you can do to help any baby turtle get it to water or something, you're giving that thing a little bit more of a head start. You know, you're increasing its odds by a little bit of making it. So if you see a baby turtle, it's best to help it find water as opposed to leaving it alone. I know with like baby birds and things, you're supposed to leave them alone for the mom to come back. I suppose, you know, there's that blanket statement that I think any parent is, you know, is can give to a child, hey, you know, things in nature should be left where they are. And that's all, I, I would be in agreement with that blanket message. But I'll tell you, when you start studying these different things in the world that we've created, and there are so many pressures, largely human related, put on these things, it's good to know that there are things that you can do for individual creatures that you find outside, depending on the species, like these that we're talking about, like the turtles, that you can do these little things that give that thing a head start. And with all the negatives that they've got to battle against, I think it's a good thing for them to be doing this for them. I really do. And there might be some people who disagree with me, but all right. I'll, take, I'll take them on. Yeah. Well, we only have two minutes left. Okay. Catherine, did you have any questions or did you want to wrap it up? Um, yeah, it looks like we're running out of time. Um, you know, my, my last question for you, Jim, could you just tell us a little bit more about Nature Discovery and where um, viewers listening in can learn more about your organization? Sure, uh, that would be great. Thanks. I'm glad we have uh, you know a minute or two to cover that. So you know, I'll just put out there our website is naturediscovery.net, not .com, but .net, and we specialize in Michigan wildlife education. I would say to anybody, um, go to our newsletters. I write an elaborate monthly newsletter, and by elaborate, I mean every single one, and it's over ten years now. Monthly newsletter has a Michigan wildlife specific or wildlife education related uh, column at the beginning of every one. And we get strong feedback from a lot of adults who tell us how interesting and how much they learn. And a lot of it is seasonal stuff, like for instance, about the turtles in the month of June, turtle egg laying month, things that everybody needs to know about turtles. So uh, changing ourselves up uh, like so many entities have to do because of the, uh, the coronavirus restrictions, we have lost tons of business related to presentations and exhibits we do, but we are inviting individuals or individual families singly by appointment only to come out to our little center we don't charge very much at all, very, very minimal thing to come out and we stay outside with people. And you saw the turtle pools out there. Kids love feeding the turtles that are in the pools on a sunny day. We have a little over six acres to walk back here. A family who was out today got, the kids got to look for and find morels in our woods. They were picking morels. Mom, I found a morel. Uh, they were all excited about that. We've got vernal ponds out back that are loaded with frogs uh, calling right now. If you come out uh, towards dusk, there's really a lot to do. Snakes, turtles, frogs, salamanders of Michigan, insects, so much more. We're not running out of material, we often tell people. So uh, our Facebook page also, if you search Nature Discovery Williamson, you'll find us and we're putting regular posts on Facebook as well, videos and uh, educational information. Perfect. Well, thanks, Jim, for joining us today. We did put a link to your newsletter on our uh, Facebook page event page. Okay, thank you for that. Awesome.
It's such a nice day. Maybe we didn't get as uh, big of a crowd as we were hoping, but uh, I, I'm going to make sure I get this onto Nature Discovery's fake Facebook page, and I'm sure we'll get a lot of good feedback on that. And I'll continue to take questions. Is there going to be email uh, question and answer? I know that's the way it was last time. Um, if people have questions, we'll have them email you. And... Excellent. Perfect. I uh, ho hope to hear from some of them, yes. All right. Thank Great. you so much for yeah. joining us. Thanks again, Jim. Take care. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Until we meet again. <laughs>